All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I am Jennifer Shahadi. This is another session of the Mad Woman's Book Club. I'm here with Adia Anyango, and we are welcoming a very exciting guest, Catherine Neville, the award-winning author of The Eight, which we read tonight. It's been published in over 40 languages, a bestseller all over the world. I mean, it's really just an incredible honor to have you with us here tonight, Catherine. I remember reading this book as a little girl. Well, I might not have been a little girl, but I remember reading it when I was pretty young and the chance to revisit it was really extraordinary. Um, so thanks for joining us and for giving us some of your time tonight. Thank you. It's a thrill to be here. Oh, and I, I, uh, I wanted to introduce Adia Nyango as well, who is, for those of you who are just joining us, she is my co-host for the Mad Woman's Book Club. She is known as the Chess Traveler, so that certainly has a lot of links with the eight. And she is the um, chair of our women's committee at U.S. Chess. Um, are, yeah. Yeah. Adia, did you want to kick off the, I know you had a lot of questions about the book. So since you're the co-host, I figured you might want to kick it off with the first question. Oh, great. Uh, welcome. And thank you so much once again, Catherine, for being here. Really thoroughly enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the, your book. Uh, I have a, a question from your bio. I know that you have lived and worked extensively overseas in Europe and in North Africa. And I was wondering, how do you see, how did you see your experiences both personal and travel and professional influencing the story? And how do you think things have changed for women in business since the period of this book, uh, since when you uh, wrote this book originally? Oh my gosh, everything has changed. It's just yeah. incredible. So I got the idea for the eight. Uh, I was um, in trouble, much as my heroine is, in trouble with my boss and my company. And I was planning on uh, resigning actually, because I felt, a few ethics problems here and there cropping up. And um, so I saw the senior partner in the hallway one day in the corridor of the, of the building. And um, he, uh, I said, um, he said, Catherine, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about something. And I said, well, I wanna to talk to you too, sir. So he said, come to my office at three o'clock. So I went to his office and for some reason I said, you go first. <laughs> and he said, we have a new project starting up in Algeria. And I said, I'll go. <laughs> and he said, do you know where Algeria is? And I said, no, but I'll look it up on a map. <laughs> so anyway, uh, about three or four months later, after I, I had to go through interviews and I had to go to Chicago and I was the only woman chosen to go there. And when I got there, I found out that uh, I was one of the other. Uh, practically the only woman uh, professional consultant uh, in the country. And, uh, but we had a couple of women who were secretaries. My secretary, Monique, was great. She always wore a very tight t-shirt and had a great body and wore tight uh, trousers. And she would go and arrange my airline tickets. And I'd go to pick up the tickets and they'd say, oh, you are Madame Monique's friend. <laughs> So she could do anything, but basically there were very few women in the country, but it was 10 years after the uh, Algerian revolution against the French when the French had departed and they thought they were running out of oil. They thought they had eight or 10 years worth of oil. So they were asking us to come in and do a balance of trade system to find out how much they were paying for all their industries and energy and how much they were ma making. And uh, as it happens, about six or eight months after I got there is when the OPEC petroleum embargo took place. And so the idea arose because I'd grown up in the Cold War, you know, East is East and West is West. And, and it, the idea of a third power, we called them the third world, they called themselves the unaligned nations, but a third power jumping into the middle of all this I just thought it reminded me so much of the French Revolution where uh, you know, the nobility had been, the royalty, the nobility, the bourgeoisie, everybody had been destroyed, even the proletariat, it was run by the mob. And it was the first real situation where the equation that had been uh, 
held things together for so long was just crumbling. And I still think to this day that the OPEC embargo uh, changed the profile of all the political scene around the world. Because we had Japanese sitting in the offices in the waiting rooms when I was going in to do my computer stuff, waiting just to find out what their quotas would be and could they cut a deal <laughs> for some more oil. People were lined up in America uh, waiting at the gas pumps to see if they could fill up their cars and trucks and tractors. So everything was amazing, but I saw it because I'd always wanted to be a, a novelist. I saw it as this really amazing picture, like a giant chess game taking place all over the world. And you don't know who the players are or what they've been chosen to do. So that was the percolating thing. And that was 1973. The book was not published till 1989. <laughs> so I had a lot of time to percolate the ideas. But I was once asked that same question that you asked Adia uh, by, uh, I think it was Jane Pauling on the Today Show when the book first came out. And she said, how do you think things would have been different at an earlier time? And I said, I don't know, because I was the first wave of women actually going into, as professionals, into the workplace. When I was coming out of um, high school or college, actually, I, I got out of college and there weren't jobs anywhere for women as a professional. If you could type, if you had a nursing degree or a teacher's certificate from an educational school, there were jobs, but that was it. And then there was this brand new profession called data processing <laughs> that I'd never heard of. <laughs> so uh, yeah, really, it, that was the pivotal turning point. And uh, in fact, I was living in New York right before that and in the 60s and uh, Gloria Steinem, who found one of the founders of Ms. Magazine uh, was running around as a journalist with Norman Mailer and Jimmy Breslin. <laughs> there was no feminism. <laughs> so things have really changed a lot. And I, I think there are many more opportunities now for women. And I also think thanks to that Queen's Gambit, um, you know, Walter Tavis wrote that book a zillion years ago, but I think just seeing a woman being able to play chess uh, was something that, you know, just wasn't happening in my era. When I created this character of Lily, no one could believe that I was inventing a character of a woman who actually wanted to <laughs> become a major chess player because there weren't, there weren't many. Wow. That's, that's, that's amazing. And um, we have a kind of related question from Catherine um, Scott. So Catherine, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, we would love it. Sure. Um, yeah, it's really great to hear you speak, Catherine. Um, oh, so thank you so much. And your book was, yeah, it was um, very liberating to have these great uh, protagonists who are fiery and, and getting shit done. Um, <laughs> Though I had one question that I wanted to get your insight on. Um, the copy that I was reading, page 530, there's a um, quote um, by Solarin where he says, um, she'll be a great chess player if she can just forget she's a woman. And then it goes on to talk about, um, like he says, because men and women think differently and they're talking about the formula. And at that point, Catherine in the story said, you know, is like, oh, well, you're thinking about the formula wrong. Here is how to, to think about it, but it doesn't really tie up his initial quote on, um, on thinking like a, a woman or a man during chess. And so I kind of wanted to get your insight on why you put that in there or why Solaren brought it up or what you're hoping to bring to the story with that thought. Yeah, well, I, it's a really great question. And I, I thought a lot about it because that was, at the time I was writing the book and the, the chess people that I knew, there were practically no women in the field, but also I was living at the time with my late, now late spouse, Dr. Carl Pribram, and he was one of the world's most famous living brain scientists, brain researchers. He was a brain surgeon and also a brain scientist. And he was one of the only people they let participate in, in the psychology and the gender studies programs. 
because he had actually discovered a lot of things about how men and women not so much think differently, but experience differently. Um, women's brains grow. I forget wh whether it's from the front to back or back to front, but anyway, the, their frontal lobes develop before boys' frontal lobes. So they are able, we, we are able to uh, learn by, by reading faster than boys. It, it, this is a generalism, but it's overall pretty accurate, regardless of what culture you're in. Um, and when we're really young, by being told, by verbally, we learn verbally more quickly because we have the, you know, these capabilities develop faster than boys. Boys, on the other hand, he says, he, he demonstrated this through thousands of, you know, experiments. Um, boys learn by, by touching things or feeling things. And I said, oh, so that's whenever they see a sign that says wet paint, they have to touch it. <laughs> Uh, that everybody fell in love with her and everybody wanted to be like her. Um, but uh, I think having Valentine disappear and having everybody love her so much, they can't just keep thinking about her and thinking about her. And so basically I noticed that the character, the, the figure I based Valentine and Mireille on were these two women in David's painting in the Rape of the Saving Women. And the, there are these big portraits at the, uh, are they at the Met in New York or at the National Gallery in DC? I think they're at the Met in New York of, of Talleyrand on one side and Madame Grand on the other side. These yeah, portraits. the Met in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like Vigée Le Brun or someone like that. Yeah. These beautiful portraits and, and Talleyrand was very, he looked like a blonde surfer and she just was the most gorgeous uh, ethereal person. So I thought, this is great. He actually married someone who looks exactly like my character that I invented. <laughs> so yeah, I had to use her and I had to use all the Catherines to get people confused. <laughs> uh, Thank you, Vicki. Thank you so much. Do you have time for one or, one or two more questions, Catherine? Sure, I'm happy. I love the fact that Philidor was a musician and that he was in that part of Germany around the same time as Bach was there and about the same time as Euler was there and that all of them had been in different courts and knew, knew different people who were already characters in the book. I love the idea of putting it together, but yeah, I think chess, math and music are all really closely re related. And uh, I, I, love, I love music. I mean, I'm like a, an opera-aholic and uh, I, I know the different voices of different people, but um, I don't do it anymore because the great opera singers aren't really there anymore. But uh, yeah, I thought, I thought how magical because, um, you know, uh, the uh, Gödel, Escher and Bach, um, he actually, uh, what's his name who wrote Gödel, Escher and Bach? He, um, he was, uh, he brought out the fact that Bach had created this endless, he was into uh, Douglas Hofstadter. He was into the endless spiral of, of sound and of math and of, uh, of art and so forth in that book. And I thought that's really beautiful to have Bach actually composing it in front of us <laughs> because he did write those two pieces of music, the one for Frederick the Great and, and the other one. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's uh, really remarkable. Um, I'd like to say also that, I, I don't know what you guys think about it, but um, I did a quiz uh, when the fire came out after the eight, and it was a quiz about different things that happen in each book. And uh, we ran it, Random House ran it on their website. But unfortunately, the people running the website didn't keep track of who got, how many people got right answers. And it turns out that nobody got <laughs> all the right answers. I made it too difficult. I can't even remember it anymore myself, but I, I wrote it down. And the first four or five questions have to do with chess players. Let me just give you one example. And I wanna know if you guys think I should put it on my website. It's, um, here's one. Uh, uh, which of the original founders of the United States was a masterful chess player and wrote a famous essay based on the concept 
that important moral lessons could be learned from the game of chess. Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, George Washington, John Adams, or Ben Franklin? <laughs> we already have an answer in the chat from um, Alexi, Alexi Root. Yeah. Uh, it's Ben Franklin and the essay is The Morals of Chess. Yes. Okay, one more and then that's it. Uh, in the opening of the fire, we learned that 11 year old child chess prodigy Alexandra Salarn has just lost her previous game in a competition against 12 year old Ukrainian chess champion Vartan Azov. What actual male child chess prodigy made the same daring queen sacrifice as Alexandra did? when he was only 14 and lost the same King's Indian defense game, but later went on to become world chess champion. Bobby Fischer, Anatoly Karpov, Gary Kasparov, Mikhail Tal, or Tigran Petrosian. <laughs> I have to look it up. <laughs> See that, yes, you should definitely put those on your, on your website. I love it. We, want, we want, all want more stuff on your website. By the way, speaking of chess trivia, um, I was going through the, the three published games of Napoleon today. Um, there is some debate over the accuracy of them. Um, I think, uh, I think there's, there's just like heated questions about whether they were really played, if they were analysis, exactly when they were played, but it was a delight to look at them. And we're actually going to look at one of them later in this class. Um, did you go through some of those games as well? Yeah, uh, someone sent me a book of Napoleon's chess games. Um, actually, it was uh, Nathan Davinsky, who was the head of FIDA, or he was the head of one of the World Chess Federations for Canada. And he wrote a book called, uh, with, uh, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on a lot of this stuff. He wrote a, a book on sort of the history of all the Batsford book of chess or something. And he sent me a little rare book. And I'm going to look for that when I go to my apartment and, and and text you or uh, email you with what the book is, but it's a really old, crumbly, rare book that has Napoleon's chess games in it from, you know, maybe maybe the mid 1800s, late 1800s. Uh, so it might it might be true. They might actually be games of his. Yeah, I think they I think they might. There a couple of them might be accurate. Yeah, it's it's pretty exciting to just I mean the history and being able to like connect with people from so many years ago and, and see the games that they played in different historical contexts, including one from um, St. Helena, I believe. So yeah, it's, it's, it's wild. Um, but Catherine, I, I wanted to um, thank you so much for your time. I mean, this has been really amazing. I know that your book made an impact on many, many people here actually had already read the book, um, even when we selected it for this club. And for, for those who hadn't, I think they're, their minds were really blown. Oh, oh I, I did have to ask you one more question. Since The Queen's Gambit came out, um, I, am, I know you, you uh, have movie deal for your book. Is that accelerating because of The Queen's Gambit? Yeah. Uh, no, it, not because of it. Um, we were about three years into it. I'm, I'm permitted to say that it is now, it is owned by uh, Sony TriStar, but I'm not permitted to say too much further, but we did have, we were at the stage where we did have showrunners and writing a script and so forth. And now we have another showrunner who's much younger. And I think we'll look at it from a perspective. That's why I was so glad to do this because you all are more the modern audience of people who will either, and, and you guys are so much brighter than any of the girls in my generation at your age. <laughs> you ask much better questions. And, uh, but they were, um, they were uh, really looking for somebody who would look at it with fresh eyes who had never read the book. And she asked some of the greatest questions. We had little powwows. And so it's progressing and we have, um, you know, they don't wanna do it as a mini series like Queen's Gambit. They wanna do it as an ongoing series. I wasn't sure how that could happen. So I'm waiting to see. <laughs> But I, I get to be a producer also, so I get to review a lot of stuff. And, um, uh, and I, I decided to loosen up the control a little bit because it's such a hard book to try to condense into 45 minutes or an hour at a time. Um, and I've, I've been through it. I've been through it with Hollywood, with Europe, with Canada, 
um, with a lot of import, Universal Studios and CBS, uh, you know, from 30 years. So I'm just sort of philosophical now. But I think Queen's Gambit really made people get interested in females uh, and uh, interesting, fun uh, female characters. None of my characters has an addiction problem, however. <laughs> I think it's still very viable. <laughs> and, and I did talk to one of the producers on the Queen's Gambit for my podcast. And what he said, the big difference was that the Queen's Gambit just did so well commercially that there's now like a great appetite for chess stories. Whereas before that, the chess films were really favorably reviewed, but they didn't like um, make a ton of money. And that that was like the big change with the Queen's Gambit. Look at Walter Tavis, you know, his book's been out forever. It never hit any bestseller lists. And, and I thought his book would be hard to make into any kind of dramatic form because it's so cerebral. It's everything's inside of her. Um, but they managed to demonstrate that, didn't they? Chess pieces on the ceiling. I thought it was great. Yeah, not on the bestseller list till now. I think now it's like, <laughs> it's, it's hitting all the highs. Of course, he's not with us to enjoy that, but still um, must be must be some part of him that knows that it's a big hit now. So um, yes, um, but seriously, Catherine, um, Catherine Neville, this has been an incredible opportunity. And I think that not only um, those, those who haven't finished the book yet um, will not only want to read this book, but all, all your other books as well. So it was a big well, you honor. Guys, you guys feel free to write me on my website anytime. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Big clap. Thank you. Everybody's thanking you in the comments. We love it. Thank you. Uh, Bye, guys. Bye. Can you disconnect me? Because I don't know how to. I don't know. How to, <laughs> I don't know how to disconnect myself. Oh yeah, sure. I can remove you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I don't want to send a report to Zoom. She didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks again, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Um, let's take a quick look at this game by Napoleon, and it might be the most famous one that he ever played. In fact, I actually kind of recognized it myself. I think I saw it many years ago. So played in 1804 against Madame de Rumassin, who was somehow new during this game. There's like a painting of the game, which kind of ties into some of my later work that Shannon knows about. Um, and the, the reversal of the, the famous uh, photo of Marcel Duchamp playing against a naked woman. So in jazz. So yes, um, of course, we know that there's a lot of female nudity in art. And this is one early example of it. So D5, now Napoleon played queen to F. Oh, sorry. He played queen H5 check first. And then after G6, he played queen F3. So now let's think a little bit about what um, Black should have done here. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a quick poll. It looks like a lot of you played bishop f5, which is an excellent move. And that is indeed what black should do here. Um, you can't take on e4 at the moment because unfortunately it is just checkmate in one here. So that wouldn't be good. And if you play the move that black actually played in the game, um, knight to h6, well, this allows white to hop in with this knight, this beautiful f6 square. So actually the knight on g8 was performing a really useful function. So that's why bishop f5 is the best move in the position. And the cool thing is, if they play g4, you can take on e4 with a tempo. But, you know, this book club's not really about getting into too much deep chess analysis. So I'll move through the rest pretty quickly um, so that we can get to those breakout rooms. Uh, but there's just a really nice combination at the end of this, which I, I love. So knight to e4 check was played by Napoleon. And now um, after king takes knight, the question is, what should you do as white? So I'll, I'll do another poll for this, and then we're going to get to our breakout rooms. Oh my God, I have so many options. Why do I have so many options here? Because there's so many checks, right? There's a possible discovered check with this knight, which means that like, there's actually six checks with the knight, right? So that's already six checks. And then of course there's queen checks, pawn checks, bishop check. Um, I think in total, I didn't even, in total there's something like 15 checks in this position or maybe a few less, maybe like 10. But 
when you're trying to figure out what the best chess move is, you really have to think through all the checks because a lot of times one of them can be devastating. I have a lot of ladies from our beginners class, which is now really like an intermediate class. So I know one of you might want to get in there. Uh, Ziva, yes. Maybe the queen to, I can't see the squares A, B, C, D, three. Yeah, queen D three looks like a good move as well. Um, but queen D three, you know, you do have to worry about knight D four. So knight D four is an option blocking. Mm -hmm. Also, I do escape a little bit if I go king E six. So it kind of gets me out of the fryer a little bit because you're gonna have to like wait ways to move and my queen is protected on D8. So not queen D3 check. Although there's probably at least two moves that win. Technically, um, there's like another move that wins, but there's one that's really a lot faster. Anybody else? I thought Jennifer was raising her hand, but she really just wanted to um, have, a, <laughs> have a sip of that delicious looking wine. Tiffany? Yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. Yeah. These, these king hunts are fun, aren't they? So our, our knight's really good because he's guarding those dark squares and we don't, we don't want the king to escape. So we want to pull him towards our army. So that the bishop sack, yeah? Yes, that's right. That's right. Give it to us. Yeah, then we get the mate in two with our queen. Uh, so we go bishop c4, check. We want to make sure he doesn't go back to e6 and we need our knight to keep guarding. So he's gonna he's gonna take that bishop or or maybe uh, ooh I got I don't know what happens if he goes to e three or d three do we get a mate in one there yeah then I think you just have the mate in one so it becomes even yeah. easier right um, yeah but if he yeah if he takes the bishop then we just we just snaggle our queen over there to um uh, b three and then d three right yeah nice little creepy maneuver. You know, looks like you're bringing them back to the center where they're attacking the knight. And this is a really nice checkmate, right? Because you see the, the, the pawn is blocking and the king's escape. Really sweet. Cool. And so, yeah, the next book is The Disordered Cosmos by Dr. Chanda Prescott-Weinstein. And um, I know she's a big fan of buying books from independent bookstores. So if you have time to buy a book from an independent bookstore she'd really love it I, there's a lot of information on her on her website i think it's the bookshop.org i didn't realize this before but if you go to like bookshop.org it's like a conglomerate of independent bookstores so you buy a book there and you like pick which smaller bookstore you want to support but basically they have every book because it seems like they all band together um, I, I only found this out actually from Chanda when I started the book club. I, I wasn't aware of that before. Yeah, Adia, do you have any final words for people? I know. I uh, thank you everyone for coming and uh, very interesting discussions. And we will send you the information, all these uh, great links in the chat. We'll gather them up and send them out to people. And look forward to seeing everybody in a month or two, it looks like. Yes. Good night, everyone. Thank you again. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Great Thank job you. getting yeah. through this book. <laughs> it was so good. Long I'm, hooked. I'm hooked to the book club now, Jen. Oh, good. Yay. <laughs>